Hi, welcome to Constitutional Chats, hosted by me, Janine Turner, and Kathy Gillespie, with students, Dakari Chapman, and me, Tova Kaplan. Join us as we discuss hot topic issues with constitutional experts. It's sponsored by Constituting America. Welcome to Constituting America's Constitutional Chats. We are so glad that you're here with us today, and we are very excited about episode four of our series on the Anti-Federalist Papers as we count down to Constitution Day. We are honored to have with us today our very special guest, Professor Horg Niprath, and I am going to get to introducing Professor Niprath in just a few minutes. But first, I want to introduce the rest of our panelists. We are sorry to say that we are missing our founder and co-president, actress Janine Turner, today. She is still tied up with the filming of the movie that she has been uh filming and we are so excited when she comes back next week she's going to tell us all about it and how we're going to be able to watch it when it comes out um but we want to go ahead and introduce today aubrey jackman who is our media director and aubrey is going to put up a poll while i am introducing her Aubrey is responsible for all the fabulous technology that you see. She also happens to be this year's We the Future Best College STEM winner. Aubrey was born and raised in Utah in the middle of seven children. She's a student at Brigham Young University and inspires to be an athletic coach. Now, Aubrey is asking y'all to fill out whether you are a student, a teacher, a parent with grand, a parent or grandparent with children, donor, press, family, friend, it just, it helps us to know who's in the audience so that we can tailor our comments a little bit more to the audience. So we'll give you all just a minute or two to, to fill that out. And then we'll let Aubrey say hello and report on the results. Yes, thank you for that, Kathy. I'll just share the results now. It seems like a lot of people have answered. Thank you everyone for doing that. So the largest group with us today are fans. We have 32% of you. And then we have 24% of parents or grandparents with children. So happy you guys are here. Then we have 12% friends. And then eight, it looks like 8% family, 4% press, another 8% of donors, and another 4% of middle and high school students. So we're Great. happy all of you are here. Well, welcome to everyone. Now we also want to introduce our student panelists today who are going to be helping us uh, ask questions of Professor Niprath and, and help us run the show. First, we have Tova Kaplan is a 17 year old student from Chicago, Illinois. Tova is a three time winner of the We the Future contest and is the national youth director of Constituting America. Tova runs our youth advisory board like a CEO. She does such a great job. Tova is passionate about inspiring young people to know and use their constitutional rights. Tova, would you like to say hello? Sure. Hi, everyone. So glad to be on here as always. And thank you for the introduction, Kathy. Well, welcome. We are also excited to have with us Jewel and Jorn Gilbert. Jewel is executive producer and Jorn is operations director of Sing for America, a family-based company that the brothers co-founded. Sing for America seeks to show the art of truth and light through live performance. Both are proud former We the Future contest winners. Sing for America is an actor-run theater company which specializes in semi-professional musicals, private training in the arts, school drama solutions, and public entertainment events, all the while revealing a colorblind world on stage. Jewel and Jorn, would you all like to say hello? Hello, everybody. And here we are learning all about some more Federalist Papers and Anti-Federalist Papers, so that is great. And we will try to do our best to make up for Janine's absence. <laughs> well, thank you. We're so glad to have you. 
And I do want to encourage all the students and parents and grandparents who are watching, encourage your students to enter our We the Future contest. Entries are due September 17th of this year, so there's still more than a month left to get your entry in. Just go on constitutingamerica.org and, and look at all the different categories that your student can enter in. As you can see, we, we stay in touch with our former contest winners, and they're involved in so many different ways in our organization, and we would love to have your students enter our contest. Now, I also want to thank our sponsor for today, Mr. Thomas Hutter of Dallas. And Thomas is a brand new Constituting America contributor, and we are so grateful to have your support, Thomas. Thomas found out about Constituting America through our Independence Day movie night that we did um, late uh, in June, right before the 4th of July, and loved what we were doing so much. He sought us out and offered to sponsor one of our Constitutional Chats podcasts. So Thomas, we thank you for being our sponsor today and, and look forward to working with you uh, on Constituting America in many different ways. Now I am very pleased to present our special guest for today, Professor Horg Niprath, a great friend of Constituting America. Professor Niprath teaches constitutional law, legal history, jurisprudence, and various business law courses at Southwestern Law School in Los Angeles. He's the faculty advisor to the Federalist Society and the Christian Legal Society at Southwestern. Professor Nibrath is one of Constituting America's constitutional scholars and has been writing essays for our 90-day study since our first year in 2010 and actually has written more essays for Constituting America's 90-day studies than any other essayist. Professor Nibrath has written over 116 essays for us throughout our 10 years of 90-day studies. So Professor Nibrath, we want to welcome you to Constitutional Chats. Our topic for today is... I'm going to turn to it so I get it exactly correct. Our topic for today is the improved science of politics. Again, it's episode four of our series. And today we're looking at Brutus One and Federalist Nine. So Professor Niprath, we'll turn it over to you and ask you to, to give us a little summary to kick us off. Very well. Uh, again, thank you for having me on once more. It's always a pleasure to see you all and to uh, be a participant in this uh, terrific program. Uh, so getting to some of the main themes uh, that you see in these two papers, uh, at the top of the list, I would say, is the question of what is a confederation in contrast to a unitary government. Uh, the word consolidation gets tossed around by both uh, Brutus and by uh, Hamilton uh, in Federalist Nine, and this word comes up in many other of the writings, uh, both by the Anti-Federalists and the uh, Federalist Papers trying to downplay this uh, problem of consolidation. Uh, this was a word that would put the uh, fear uh, of despotism uh, emerging uh, into all the good Republicans at the time, uh, because what they saw as happening was that this earlier confederation where main uh, where the sovereignty and the main power rested in the state governments and in their local communities, that this was going to be ceded to some elite in the new federal or national capital that was going to exercise these uh, uh, powers uh, over the states. Uh, so consolidation was something that we might say, well, what's, you know, what's the big deal, consolidation? But this was a major topic at the time, a major topic of debate. Another, another way to look at this is, where is the ultimate governing sovereignty going to be? Is it going to be in the states and their localities? Uh, is it going to be in the state legislatures, in other words? Or is it going to be in this distant capital? Um, put yet another way, one might look at this, were the Articles of Confederation a constitution? Or were the Articles of Confederation nothing more than a league of friendship, as one phrase in the Articles mentions? Uh, and one can certainly make an argument for both of these uh, propositions, right? That there was something called the United States even before the Constitution of 1787. Um, uh, on the other hand, one can also say that, well, no, it really wasn't, uh, that the federal head had to act through these state sovereignties. So consolidation 
That's a main theme that runs through these papers as well as many of the others. Um, another topic that is running through this, and these are related, uh, can Republican government exist in a large and diverse entity? Uh, large uh, in the sense of both geography and population, diverse in the sense of interests, uh, religion, uh, uh, customs, uh, and, and so on. Um, the problem, this is really a problem of being able to perceive in a republic the res publica, right? The thing of the public, that the, the public matters. How can you have a community, a political community, uh, is what Yates is, is uh, what Brutus is raising. How can you have a political community that extends over this large area where there are 3 million people already? And he says that area can contain easily 10 times as much uh, in population. How can you have a community? And this is an issue that goes back uh, to the ancients, right? Uh, Aristotle says uh, with uh, one person, you don't have a polis, a political community. With 100,000, you no longer have one. Uh, Plato addressed that issue. The framers addressed that issue in the context of assigning population per district. At the time, it was that it was going to be 30,000 per district until they could come up with some kind of other formula. Um, and there's some, I'm not going to get into the, that kind of those weeds, but uh, there's some interesting correlation between that number of 30,000 and what Plato came up with as an ideal political community size and what Aristotle came up with is an interesting uh, correlation. So today we have to ask that question, right? Uh, we have uh, 320 million people in this country. Let's make it 300 to million uh, to, to, make it, uh, uh, to make the arithmetic easy. Uh, how many representatives at 30,000 per representative would that mean? Well, it mean 10,000 representatives. So Brutus is saying, look, how can you have a republic? Because on the one hand, you need to be able to have a small enough community that you can actually gauge what the public interest requires, what the res publica means. At the same time, you can't have a government of 10,000 people, then you have a democracy and all the problems that arise in the old Athenian democracy. Uh, so you can't possibly have a republic of this size. And uh, the problem of diverse interests, diversity, you know, we, we like to laud that, you know, diversity is our strength, we hear all that. And that's certainly true in many respects, but it also has its costs. And what Brutus raises is when you have diversity like this, everybody's gonna be out for themselves and for their own interest group. Uh, it's going to actually lessen civic participation. There are studies that, that show that. Uh, so there's a cost, right? Uh, so uh, those are the main themes. What is a, uh, a, a, a confederation versus unitary government? Can we have a republic of the size? Now, Hamilton, of course, responds to that and says, look, you know, as, as Hamilton is wont to do, he deflects, he, he changes the definition, he uses sarcasm, he uses ad hominem, he uses persuasive lawyerly reasoning. Uh, if you read Hamilton, it's actually sometimes funny to try to, what, what mood was he in that day? Um, so uh, he uh, uh, says, you know, confederation versus consolidation, this is not really a big deal, right? You're making too much of this. It really is a confederation, after all, can mean any association of states in some form of self this, right? So he tries to, to blunt that whole argument and try to, tries to obfuscate these uh, distinctions that the anti-federalists uh, were raising. Um, now, some other, some other issues uh, that are maybe a little bit more uh, below the surface or not quite as central to the discussion there uh, was the definition of uh, the necessary and proper clause and the supremacy clause, and that the necessary and proper clause and the supremacy clause showed that the central government was going to be to, to, to Brutus, a government in full force, a unitary government. It would have all the attributes of a government, not of a confederation of equals. Uh, and that sooner or later, the states would be annihilated. Right? The, 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 the um, uh, supporters of the Constitution, Hamilton included, 
uh, try to argue that, well, the government is uh, sort of a combination of state sovereignty and federal sovereignty, uh, which uh, interesting is a kind of medieval idea of looking at things. Uh, but uh, the anti-federalists kept saying that's impossible. You can't divide sovereignty in that way. Sooner or later, one or the other is going to prevail. It's either going to be the states or the national government. And a, a sovereignty is going to, as a practical matter, lie somewhere. It's not going to be split that way. That's just not how systems work. That's not how people work. And uh, the, the anti-federalists said it's eventually going to result in the annihilation, as I said, of the states. Uh, I always ask my students, um, looking at the systems today, at uh, how the system's working today, who had the better crystal ball? The opponents of the Constitution or the supporters of the Constitution as to how the government eventually emerged as society grew. Right? Now, that's not to say that the anti-federalist solution was right, that the articles were good. Uh, it's always easier to criticize than to, 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 to construct something. But uh, the criticisms were well taken, it seems to me. Um, and not sure that the supporters of the Constitution uh, ultimately were able to respond to them uh, satisfactorily. Um, they also address the scope of the taxing and borrowing powers. And by the way, these issues about the uh, necessary and proper clause, for example, Hamilton discusses this in greater detail, Madison discusses this in greater detail in subsequent essays, right? So it's not just this essay nine. Uh, many of these anti-federalist critiques uh, that were written, particularly by, by, by important writers such as Brutus and such as Cato, who wrote a series of these essays. The Federalists, uh, Hamilton, Madison, Jay, were responding to them often and spent a considerable amount of time and effort dealing with some parts of these at a time. Uh, the, the, the issue of the taxing power, uh, Hamilton addresses in Federalist 32, uh, because the concern that Brutus raises is, look, the federal government is going to suck the money out of everybody's pocket. The states, there's only so much money you can get out of people. And the states are going to be left high and dry. And if the states can't fund themselves, they don't have a government. Right, so uh, the, the importance of uh, defining what those powers are and the Federalists, uh, the Anti-Federalists rather, said time and time again that these powers are complete and absolute. Uh, Jefferson um, uh, later on uh, said that uh, with the necessary and proper clause, uh, and this is a common argument uh, that's been made, is that if you have a government of defined objective powers, right? You, the, the supposedly our constitution, uh, Congress only has certain defined and limited powers. But if you give a broad definition to that, give the Congress also the power to use any means that are necessary and proper, if you in, interpret that phrase very loosely, you might as well have given Congress all powers in the first place. Right? Because if I can only regulate interstate commerce, but I can all do these other things in order to say, well, this is somehow connected to the regulation of interstate commerce, uh, you might as well have said, hey, you know, do what you want. Uh, so this critique comes from the earliest days that the, these powers are full and complete, and they, no matter what window dressings put up there, in reality, the federal government's powers are unlimited. Um, I also want to point out here that uh, something that's a theme that's, that runs not just through this paper here, but through some of the other papers uh, that the critics of the Constitution raised, they weren't all necessarily fans of the Articles of Confederation. Now, if you look at the third paragraph, beginning of the third paragraph of Brutus's essay here, uh, he's basically saying, look, you know, there are problems with the current system. But uh, so if, if this constitution is a great one, then by all means, let's, let's put it in. But I don't think it's a good, con it's, it's, it's a good document, it's a good plan. We need something else, right? And it's important to remember that, that uh, yes, some of the opponents of the constitution were vigorous defenders of the articles, but others like, like uh, he uh, were troubled and wanted to do something uh, about the Articles of Confederation, just not 
they were afraid this one went too far. So I think it's important to, to remember that as one reads these, any number of these anti-federalist papers in this course. Well, thank you, Professor Niprath. That was a great summary that you just gave us. And I wanted to remind the audience uh, that if you are looking for the anti-federalist paper that we're talking about today or the federalist paper, you can go on our website, constitutingamerica.org, scroll down a little bit. You'll see today's episode, click learn more, and there'll be hyperlinks to both papers. So if you want to be looking at those papers and, and thinking of some questions as we as we go on through this episode, we invite y'all to, to seek them out on our website. Um, I wanted to ask Professor Niprath regarding the author of Brutus. So much is known about the authors of the Federalist Papers of Publius, uh, Hamilton, Madison, John Jay, but I, I know I don't know a lot about the, the men who wrote, who were behind the Anti-Federalist Papers. Uh, first of all, who, who did write, did the same person write all of the papers entitled Brutus? And can you tell us a little bit about him? Sure. Uh, his name was Robert Yates. Uh, he was a, um, uh, I believe, a lower court judge, not a Supreme Court judge uh, in New York. Uh, and he was one of the three delegates from New York to the Philadelphia Convention. Uh, New York sent three delegates, Alexander Hamilton, Robert Yates, and Judge uh, Lansing, I forget what his first name was. Um, uh, both Judge Lansing and uh, Judge Yates uh, left the Philadelphia Convention early uh, in August, I believe, uh, because they were not happy with the way the project was going. Uh, too much power being given to the central government and not enough protection of rights. So they left early, which left, interestingly, left New York State without a quorum at the Philadelphia Convention. Only Alexander Hamilton was left. So New York can't vote <laughs> in the last several weeks of the convention. Uh, so uh, it left him in quite a bind. Uh, he uh, was a moderate, as I said, opponent of the constitution. Uh, he was perhaps the most prolific single writer and all of the Brutus essays are uh, uh, Yeats essays. Uh, there was another uh, a person by the name of Yates, Abram Yates, that uh, was active in the New York Convention. That's somebody completely different. Um, so uh, uh, he, uh, Brutus and Cato, uh, who uh, was one of the uh, uh, other prolific writers, uh, were some of the main uh, critics that the Federalists are responding to, because both of them wrote series of essays. No, they didn't write, you know, 85 of them like the Federalist uh, papers, uh, but they wrote lengthy ones, hard-hitting ones that were uh, scoring political points. Remember, this is all going on during the New York Ratifying Convention. Uh, if you read Yeats's essay here, interestingly enough, it's published in October 1787. But the way he is writing, it sounds like he wrote this essay while the convention was still going on. Because uh, it, 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 it says here, basically it's addressing to you, well, who's you, the people of New York, you are going to be uh, deciding on this constitution through a convention most likely, he says, because he knew where this was going, right? So, uh, but this was published before the, the supporters of Federalists, uh, of, of the Constitution, the, the, the Federalists, uh, organized themselves. They're responding oftentimes to people like uh, Cato and, and, and Brutus. Uh, Cato, uh, historians believe, was uh, uh, Governor George Clinton of New York, who uh, was the chair of the um, uh, New York Ratifying Convention. So you have an interesting situation there that uh, there's a an opponent, uh, he didn't, you know, he wasn't, it was suspected that he was the one, but nobody could pin it on him at the time. Uh, you have this anti-constitution governor who is very politically powerful, the longest serving governor in the history of the United States, uh, who's controlling this convention. Now you understand why the vote in New York came down to the wire. They weren't sure how that vote was gonna come out and it came out 30 to 27 in favor of the constitution. That's how close it was. And when all was said and done, but that's why uh, you, know, you get uh, Hamilton, Fed uh, Madison and Jay organizing to persuade people in the New York convention and the Virginia convention going on concurrently 
uh, that this uh, document had to be adopted. And speaking of Hamilton, the title of today's episode, we, uh, Professor Lloyd, who helped us design uh, the study, had entitled our episode for the improved science of politics. Could you tell us a little bit about that? I think, doesn't Hamilton write in Federalist 9 a little bit about the improved science of politics? Yeah, uh, indeed he does. And uh, maybe this is uh, Federalist Papers to blame for the change in terminology from the study of government politics to political science. Um, this, uh, what, what, what Hamilton's doing there is uh, uh, a couple of things. One, uh, it's reflective to some extent of the framers' attitudes that uh, kind of an Aristotelian approach uh, right, uh, in one of the other Federalist papers, either Jay or, or Hamilton saying, uh, let experience, right, the best teacher be our guide in this. So let's be practical. This, this theme comes through over and over again. You know, Madison uh, at, at one point is saying, look, you know, yeah, maybe this whole project is to some extent illegitimate because we exceeded our charge, but uh, let's be practical. If it came out with something good, you know, uh, what's the harm? Uh, so, uh, in this, in, in another way, this reflects a kind of 17th, 18th century approach. Um, uh, this, uh, the, the reliance on the scientific method, right? Hobbes uh, had this whole bit of Thomas Hobbes about the new science of statecraft. We're going to be getting rid of these old superstitions, these old formalisms, this sort of just abstract way of thinking, and let's get practical. And in this particular case, yes, it's true that, 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 that uh, uh, what uh, Brutus uh, is saying about republics and sizes and all of this was traditionally a problem. But since then, we've come to understood things better about politics. And so now what we've set up here in the Constitution, we've tried to deal with some of these alleged defects. Uh, and harms uh, that would come about if we try to have a Republican government over a large uh, entity. Well, great, thank you so much. I am gonna toss it to Tova and I know Tova's got quite a few questions and Tova, we always look forward to your questions. Thanks so much, um, this is fascinating. I always love getting so deep into this topic. Um, just going back to some of the things you were saying earlier, uh, you were talking about the, the 30,000 community size. Um, could you expound more on that? That sounded really interesting to hear about. Yes. Uh, so in the Constitution, when the, um, and there, there was a lot of debate about this, how, what should the size of this be? Uh, uh, when they're trying to set up the House of Representatives, right, which is going to be apportioned according to uh, population. Uh, using, including the three-fifth rule uh, where those, uh, the, those numbers would apply. Um, the, uh, uh, why that number? And the debate was exactly that. Well, we've got to have a representative that can actually get a sense of the community, that the people in that district are going to be, they're going to know this person, they're going to be able to hold this person responsible if things go wrong, uh, uh, they can communicate with that person. Uh, so that, and, and, and the representative in turn will know the interests of that district, of the representatives. Uh, at the same time, we can't make it so small that, uh, for one thing, the national government is supposed to deal with national issues. They're not supposed to be dealing with these very local issues like where can housing be built locally? Where can, what health plan are you going to get? Uh, uh, that's not what the national government's about. So we don't want to run the risk that we have so many people in the legislature that it can't function, right? Even now, you have the House of Representatives, 435 people. It's a much different uh, structure, the way it operates, than the Senate is, uh, much more hierarchical and centrally controlled than the Senate. So um, uh, imagine having, you know, 1,000 or 2,000 or 10,000 uh, people, uh, even if you could find space for them. So uh, the, the question of what is a community is something that if you're going to have self-government of some sort, right, not just going to have a, a military dictatorship, you have self-government of some sort, then uh, you have to 
figure out, you know, how can we say we are a political community that can decide these things, that can decide for our collective interest in any kind of knowledgeable fashion, right? And that's a question that goes back to the ancient writers. Plato's discussing this and he comes up with some magic number of 5,000 plus, but that would include only certain people, not others would be excluded from the calculation. Uh, you know, Aristotle's tossing around a number, you know, like 50,000, uh, well, but that wouldn't include uh, the slaves, that wouldn't include women. So, yeah, you know, how, how, do, you, uh, how do you do that number? But the, the, the issue is always the same, right? How do you have a political community uh, where the governor and the governed have a connection? And that's gonna be a particular problem when you have people that are scattered all over the place, uh, large geographical distances. Right? So you have to take, I mean, just to divert here for a minute. Uh, some of the republics, uh, like in the Dutch Republic, the Venetian Republic, they weren't as representative as what the framers set up. But the difference was the people lived cheek by jowl with each other. There was no, the, the, the people who are running the place lived next door to the people who were being governed. So you got interaction. They could let their governors know what was going on. How, how do you do that when you have it in the United States? Right, uh, thank you so much. And then as, on that same note, as America has gotten you know, bigger and more diverse, uh, do you think the principles of federalism have become more or less relevant? I think the, uh, the, 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 uh, what the framers probably expected how it was going to work uh, has become, as a practical matter, less relevant. Uh, I, I think there's little, little doubt about that. Uh, the size of the national government, the way it's grown uh, in, in relation to the states and local governments. I'm not saying states or local governments have withered away, but uh, you know, the, 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 the numbers are there. Uh, but from a different perspective, are the principles of federalism important? I think the questions that we're discussing here today and that were raised by the critics and attempted to be answered by, by, by the supporters of the Constitution are more important than ever. Uh, you know, is there something we can do that will uh, solve some of the issues that are going on right now, uh, the friction in this country? Uh, to what extent can a devolution of governing power help provide more play in the joints, shall we say. So I think from that perspective, principles of federalism are more important to be discussed uh, than they were, say, 50 years ago. Wow, thank you. Um, and then Lori Berg asks a question. Um, so she says, hello from New Jersey. Um, could you please explain the difference between a republic and a democracy? And then could you explain, this is my own addition, how that uh, difference factors into the federalist, anti-federalist debate? Okay, uh, the difference between democracy versus republic uh, as far as it factoring into the debate between the two groups, I think is not that significant. Uh, both groups uh, were not in favor of democracy and did not see democracy as a viable form of government, uh, except perhaps at the town level, uh, you know, the New England town meeting or something like that. Uh, that they also saw dangers of factionalism and passion running amok in a democracy uh, that would perhaps be uh, somewhat ameliorated and cushioned in a republic. So the big difference between, uh, and, and this is a common definition, the, the Brutus kind of talks about it, uh, Madison in his uh, famous uh, Federalist uh, 10 talks about this, uh, the difference between the, uh, the, the democracy and the republic is that a democracy is governed by the governed themselves, right? They participate, as say, in a town meeting. They actually vote on public policy. Whereas a republic, certain people are selected. In our system, uh, the, 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 the participatory republic, if you want, the people or some group of them selects representatives. And then those representatives vote 
uh, on the public issues. Uh, it, Brutus says, in a pure democracy, the people are the sovereign and their will is declared by themselves. For this purpose, they must all come together to deliberate and decide. This government, uh, kind of government cannot be exercised, therefore, over a country of any considerable extent, it must be confined to a single city, etc. In a free republic, although all laws are derived from the consent of the people, yet the people do not declare their consent by themselves in person, but by representatives chosen by them who are supposed to know the minds of their constituents and to be possessed of integrity to declare this mind. That's very similar to the definition that Madison uses in, in, in Federalist 10. I'll give you an, uh, very quickly an example in modern politics. In California, most laws, uh, for better or worse, are made by the California legislature and then they're signed by the governor, right? But there's also a way for the people to have what's called a statutory initiative. So you can also have a state constitutional initiative, but let's stick with the statute. So the people can themselves vote on a particular measure. The first, that is the legislature voting would be a Republican approach. The people themselves doing it would be a democratic approach. Great. Um, and then uh, this is just like a more basic question, but just so we're all on the same page, could you talk about um, why the Articles of Confederation failed in the first place and um, how that influenced the Federalists' decision to push for their position? Sure. Uh, there are a lot of different theories that are out there uh, as to why the Articles of Confederation failed or whether it, in fact, uh, some people would say they didn't really fail. Right? One of the arguments of the uh, uh, opponents of the Constitution was, well, what's the big deal? Uh, things haven't gone that bad. The Articles brought us through the war against Great Britain. Peace has barely been in effect for a few years and you're already complaining. Give the, you know, give the Articles a chance. If I were to say what the big uh, problem was, was the inability to amend the Articles of Confederation short of unanimous approach by, I mean, consent rather, by the state legislatures. That approach, I think, doomed them because there were a number of proposals that were made uh, in the 1780s uh, to reform the Articles, uh, to introduce a Commerce Clause, for example, uh, to give a limited source of tax, uh, uh, tax um, uh, source uh, directly to the Articles government. Uh, so there were some amendments that were being proposed already, and there'd be one state that would object, or two states that would be object. Everybody else going, yeah, this is great. Right? So that inflexibility is what, and I, uh, is what I believe uh, doomed the Articles uh, ultimately. Great, that's all I have. Thank you so much. Well, let's go to Jewel and Jorn. Jewel and Jorn. Um... Hi, Professor. Hey, guys. Very interesting. I, I really enjoyed reading Brutus's. Uh, I love the way he opened as he tells us why it's so important. He has a line in there. He says, if you basically, if you do this right, uh, future generations are going to call you blessed. And he says free men and liberty are going to be on a continent and it sets us up. And I think what's amazing is that whether Federalists or Anti-Federalists, they seem to understand the moment that they were in. And that is nothing short of a miracle and should really be looked at. I think as we have this discussion that it's not often you can look at a moment in history that I guess you were in and think that understand the cataclysmic event that it is. Um, and for some reason they did. I think that what he said though, as a critique of the constitution, beings as a lot of us here, take these anti-federalist positions now because we see how they were right about so much. We see how they played out now here these years later, but at the same time, I'm always measured in my head because eventually I'll get back to the idea. Well, like you said, it is easier to critique than construct and that the construction of the constitution is the most effective and revolutionary governing document in human history. 
so for all of the improvements that we wish were in it or the problems in it at the same time, we do have to contend with historical context, which is that while it's pretty ridiculous how efficient and effective it's become, and that actually may be part of what, uh, what has allowed the overreaches as well, which is an interesting dichotomy because then we're faced with asking ourselves, is the success of the document part of what has made the overreaches and power possible? And they may be the same thing, the same answer. So I've been trying to think about points in history where we had the fork in the road and we've gone to where the federal government has become overpowering. And there's one big elephant in the room and it's the civil war. Part of my issue looking back is that, is there any possible way we could think that the civil war or slavery was going to be handled in any type of confederation or any type of thing set up, any type of government set up by the anti-federalists? And I don't think it could have been because there wouldn't have even been the issue of states' rights presented the same way and they would have had more power. Abraham Lincoln's overreaches in power for the Civil War are well documented. Um, and yet all of us agree that slavery needed to end one way or another. So I guess almost not trying to answer the with the Civil War because it's almost a different kind of question because it's because that is not necessarily in the principle of federalism or not. Can you point to another instance where we crossed over from the states having such sovereignty to today where it's really unrecognizable of state sovereignty versus federal sovereignty of the United States besides the Civil War? I think the, uh, if I were to pick uh, uh, one other point, uh, it would probably be the New Deal and the attitude that changed their relation uh, between the, uh, that, that became part of sort of the accepted uh, uh, sense of the people uh, in relation to their government, that uh, uh, the, the New Deal, uh, and then the security state following World War II, uh, that changed a lot of things between the individual and the government uh, and between the different levels of government. Uh, your point about the Civil War, I think, is, is very well taken. Who knows uh, how that would have been handled in the Articles of Confederation. Uh, it has to be remembered that, uh, that Abraham Lincoln was a big supporter of a constitutional amendment to retain slavery in the states that, where it existed. Uh, at, at the, on the eve of the Civil War, there was a last ditch effort to get that pushed through to avoid, to avert the Civil War. Um, that didn't matter ultimately. Uh, so yes, this was a defining moment and the role between the, the relationship between the national government and the states did change somewhat in the 13th, 14th, 15th amendments, particularly the 14th. Uh, but I don't think as a practical matter, it was as big a shift as uh, in, in, in federalism as uh, the, uh, the, the uh, New Deal was. Professor Lloyd, last week, we talked about um, the 16th, 17th, and 18th Amendments, I believe. And one, what his answer to one of my questions, which I raised, which was um, similar to this, but different, was that he said that from, that the anti-federalists and federalists had, a certain philosophy about man's rights and individual liberty, but that by the time we got to the New Deal and those 16, 17, 18 amendments, that there was a new ideology of progressivism, which was completely separate and novel of the other two. And I agreed with them. And I think that's similar to what you're saying with the new, with, with pointing to the New Deal. Do you think that, um, See, I guess what I'm trying to ask is that regardless of what was written on paper, do you, I wonder if what happened around the 1920s would have changed any document or if it was that they could only do it because they had the systems in place throughout through the constitution 
or if they would have basically violated whatever was written and accomplished their goals because they got pop popular opinion behind them. All right. I, I think you put your finger on it. I, I would not include the 18th Amendment on that, but the 16th and the 17th, particularly the 17th, the direct election of senators, uh, that, that's correct. Uh, uh, remember the New Deal, when I mentioned the New Deal, the New Deal was a culmination of currents of events uh, that had already been kind of put in place. Uh, there was an interregnum there in the 1920s uh, where the, the progressive uh, project that starts with Woodrow Wilson and actually in some of the states earlier than that with the Populist Party and the Progressive Party, uh, that you had that shift. And, and you bring up an important point. I'm not sure that any document, written document, would have been able to resist that because there's a fundamental uh, principle at work here. And that is that a people, uh, there's, there's a formal constitution. It might be a formal written constitution, but the constitution with a small c is ultimately how the system actually works. And there's a saying from Rousseau that every people get the government they deserve. Uh, so ultimately, whatever the paper says, if the people really are pushing for something else through economic development, uh, you know, size, uh, fashions, you know, whatever it is, war, uh, that is going to become the new system. And the uh, old system is going to be replaced, if not formally, at least in the matter of interpretation and application. I think that's what happened. The progressive system was totally at odds. Their very, very conception of the state and the individual, their very conception of the Constitution was vastly different from the sort of Newtonian machinery of the Constitution uh, that the framers set up and based on sort of basic individual liberty and, 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 and that. And the progressive view was that the individual was part of the state, the organic state, a, a cog in the machine, if you want to call it that, uh, versus the focus on everyone has these God-given rights that you see in the Declaration of Independence, and that theory is carried forward in the Constitution. And it's so, I think that Brutus also points out one thing that allowed for the, that one, one function that allowed um, that progressive um, ideology to take root, and that is the fact that if you have a federal court, that it's going to be um, superior to the um, state courts. Do you think there was any way to resolve that conflict and retain a federal and state court system? Okay, so um, Brutus brings this up in other essays as well. He's a judge, he's very interested in this uh, sort of thing. But understand that other than the US Supreme Court, there's no requirement that there be any federal courts. In fact, it was anticipated, and for a long time, uh, uh, basic federal issues were resolved by the state courts. Uh, there were federal, inferior federal courts, but they didn't have broad federal question jurisdiction. That was mostly resolved at the state level. Why? Because the argument was, first of all, we don't have to set up a separate expensive court system, but secondly, it allows the states some kind of participation now, in the federal government, it gives additional protections to the states to have this. Yes, we're going to have the Supreme Court, but uh, uh, you know we're going to have these state uh, these 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 state courts. Um, it, it's difficult to gauge uh, what the influence of state versus federal courts are. Yes, it's presumably a state uh, court is going to be more responsive to local needs than, than a, a federal court might be. It's although the, even there, the verdict is still uh, not uh, clear. Um, and, and certainly federal judges uh, consider themselves uh, perhaps at a higher level than state judges. So there is, is that a kind of supervisors. But the attitude really that's important there is how do the judges perceive themselves and what will the people let the judges get away with? To what extent is this admittedly anti-democratic institution of the judiciary going to be able to control uh, what the people want, uh, for better or worse, right? The kinds of decisions that have come out. Uh, yes, judicial review 
is sometimes attributed to John Marsh and Marbury's Madison, although if you read earlier court decisions, they were already talking about it at the time, <laughs> striking down federal and state laws. But uh, 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 it, it's, it's ultimately what uh, can a dis could a decision, and I'm not taking a political position on this, but a position, a, con a decision like Roe versus Wade or the Obergefell decision, could those have been made the day after Marbury versus Madison? And the answer clearly is no, it could not have been made. Those judges would have been impeached in no time at all. Uh, so there's been a shift in the population. Maybe it's in response to, well, we can't control as much who our representatives are and what they do. So we're looking to these other avenues to try to win, if you want, what we couldn't win in the political process, that the political process is somehow stuck. And so we're gonna find some other avenue. Uh, that's one argument about the role of the courts. Uh, but certainly different than 200 years ago. Well, thank you. We only have 10 minutes left. We want to get to some audience questions, but I also want to make sure we get to Joran. Joran, do you? Yeah. Have a yeah. Um, <clears throat> in Brutus, he, he talks about how a republic's manners and sentiments, their interests have to all be similar to really succeed. And for it not to, just so I don't miss say here, you know, for, for the good of the people, okay? For the good of the people to be met, the sentiments of the Republic have to be in line with each other. So he says it's impossible for, for the United States because with so many people, you cannot have the same sentiments. I wanna know really what, what caused that line of thought to think that the public good, does he mean the public good or the or my personal what i want my my good you know not but not that's not truly my good that's just my wants or the public good and why does he believe that just because you're split up in the in the states that they will get along better or have more similar sentiments because that's not a foregone conclusion yeah, uh, uh, some excellent points there. Uh, and as to, I'll start with the last one uh, uh, here. Uh, and it's, it's a point that Hamilton makes in rebuttal, right? Uh, look, if we're gonna go with the, this theory that is being thrown out there about the, the republics being small size, you're gonna have to cut down the states. You're gonna have to cut down Pennsylvania, Virginia, New York, Massachusetts, North Carolina uh, uh, into manageable sizes because they're too big too, the definition of classic republics. So, uh, but the, the argument that Brutus is making is a traditional one. Um, dissent has a cost. And the larger the group is, the less homogeneous it is, okay? So, uh, and the more what's gonna happen is that people are gonna look for their own interest. Classic republicanism had a Big was, was very much concerned about doing things for the community, uh, that we must act for the general welfare. Uh, that will help preserve our liberty, but we must act for the general welfare, not for ourselves, for our parochial, parochial interests. Uh, and you can't do that when you have a large, diverse community. The, the, the larger it is, the more likely it's gonna develop into factions anyway. Uh, and uh, the less there's going to be this community spirit, because I don't know these people over here. Why should I, uh, why should I look out for these people over here who are completely different from me? Uh, the tendency then is to be, develop factions and self-interest, right? That's a sort of classic argument that the way you, uh, you, you avoid that is by having sort of common sense and a common goal, a common spirit, if you want. Um, and so when you have diverse religions, diverse languages, diverse ethnicities, uh, 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 diverse economic interests, all of those tear at that sense of community. Now, right, there's also good that comes from that, right, that we might say, but there is a cost. And so for a republic to work, there has to be a consensus as to, that can develop as to res publica, public the public good. 
the common welfare. People have to be willing to sacrifice for that. Right? The larger the communities, less people are willing to sacrifice. Why should I, as a taxpayer of California, pay for things that are going to go to the people of Missouri? Okay, um, and, and, and so on. I mean, I read this a lot. California is about to go bankrupt. Uh, and you hear out of state are saying, well, why should we bail them out? The federal government's going to bail them out. Why should they do that? Let the Californians clean up their own messes. Right? That's, that's what he's getting at about the commonality and the problems of different interests in a larger area. Hamil uh, Madison, by the way, in Federalist 10, brings a beautiful response to that. He turns things inside out and says, look, you're going to have factions even in the state government, and you get these bad factions. That's just human, human nature. It just comes from the conditions in society, the haves and have-nots, if nothing else. And any disease or sort of, sort of, sort of passion is likely to consume people in the local area more so in the whole state and more so in the state than in the national government, which has all these diverse competing interests. So he turns what the, the anti-federalists kept saying was a problem into a virtue. Well, thank you. I think Jordan, you have to pass to Kathy, right? Yeah, if, Jordan, if you're okay, if we go to just a couple of uh, audience questions. Oh, Ron yeah. Meyer asked a really interesting question. How do you think, uh, Professor Niprath, that Hamilton and Madison would assess the quality of their work product, the Constitution today? Do you think they would admit that that some of the anti-federalist concerns actually had merit? Uh, probably Madison more than Hamilton would do that. <laughs> um, Hamilton was not entirely uh, opposed to a very strong uh, central government and the diminution of the role of the states into sort of mere subordinates uh, than Madison. Uh, you know, so I mean, I, I can't, you know, put obviously words into their mouths, but uh, uh, I, I, I just think that um, Hamilton coming from a commercial background uh, uh, from New York City uh, would see the role of, and, and his view of the individual, uh, would view the role of government today, I think, more positively than Madison would. Great. And then Herb Johnston uh, asked something that we we spend quite a bit of time on uh, teaching students, actually. Professor, do you believe that every individual citizen and person has individual God-given rights or, you know, that they're born with their rights? Well, well that's, that's uh, the position that the framers generally started with. Uh, uh, it's in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, that's, you know, the, the, the constant discussion here about freedom and, 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 and liberty. Uh, uh, personally, I subscribe to that uh, notion uh, that uh, we have these inherently uh, as rights bearing creatures. And that, by the way, that line of thinking goes back to the Stoics, the ancient Romans, and, 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 and uh, in fact, a century or two before that. Uh, so this is not novel with us. But uh, that said, a lot of people don't, right? You, 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 they see that rights are given to you by the government and uh, therefore they can be taken away by the government, uh, by the majority. Uh, and I think the, 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 both the Anti-Federalists and the Federalists uh, would have been shocked by that very idea, right? Uh, the rights are not created, in the, for example, the Bill of Rights, they're not created by the Constitution. They're recognized as constitutional protections under the constitution, but they're not created. I, I, students sometimes write, the con First Amendment grants us the right of free speech. No, 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 <laughs> the constitution doesn't do anything. Okay. So it's a common misconception, I think. Well, and we are at time and we thank you so much for your time. This has been a fascinating discussion today. And we wanna thank our audience for all of your great questions and, and for being on with us today. We wanna to make, we wanna invite everyone to come to our book club meeting this Thursday night at 7 p.m. Eastern. It's gonna be really interesting. We've got a young lady, Gigi McBride, who has written a book for children called Gigi at the White House, talking about her time as, uh, 
Anita McBride's daughter when and Anita McBride was the chief of staff to First Lady Laura Bush in the White House. So Gigi talks about as a young girl, all of her very interesting experiences in the White House and is going to tell us what life is really like inside the White House. She Gigi's actually spent the night in the Lincoln bedroom. She's been uh, extensively around the residence, and we think it'll be so interesting to hear from her. So to sign up for this Thursday night, 7 p.m. Eastern, Gigi at the White House, just go on our website and scroll down to book club and you'll have the link right there. And then don't forget to join us next week, Tuesday, August 3rd, the role of the executive in Old Wig 5 and Federalist 71. So again, we wanna thank you all for being with us today. And um, Professor Nipper, I thank you. We, we so appreciate your time and, and all you do My to pleasure. help us advance constitution education. So thank you, Jewel, Jorn, Tova, Aubrey, and we will see y'all soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank Professor. You. Bye. Bye. Thank you guys.